Welcome to the Virginia Mason Institute quarterly webinar series, Building Lean Leaders. Our, present today, our presentation today is Eliminating Waste Using Lean Facility Design Principles. Virginia Mason Institute provides coaching and education to organizations in order to transform healthcare worldwide. My name is Jamie Kahn, and as an Institute team member, I am proud to introduce our presenter today, Chris Backus. Chris is a senior faculty member at Virginia Mason Institute. He leads improvement activities, workshops, and training for healthcare leaders and providers worldwide. By embedding innovative methods into the lean concepts he teaches, he works with clients to unlock the revolutionary thinking necessary to transform healthcare. In his three P projects at client sites, he works with healthcare leaders, architects, medical planners, and general contractors to design or redesign ambulatory surgery centers, emergency departments, inpatient and outpatient care environments, urgent care centers, labor and delivery facilities, cancer care facilities, and patient safety programs. Chris is certified in the Virginia Mason production system and 3P facilitation. Chris and I encourage you to ask questions throughout the session using the GoToWebinar chat or question tool. We will address questions during our live Q&A session following the presentation. Today's session will be recorded and posted on our website at www.virginiamasoninstitute.org. Webinar attendees will receive the recording and the Q&A document following um, the session via email. Thank you so much for attending. And I will now hand it over to Chris to begin the webinar, Eliminating Waste Using Lean Facility Design Principles. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining. Very excited to share this time with you today. So we begin uh, Lean Facility Design with the question, what is waste? Waste is the burden of work. It's the thing that keeps us from doing what we'd like to do. And there's waste both in process and in space. Uh, one of the opportunities we have with waste is to really think differently about uh, how we work, uh, where we work, and why we work a certain way. And in doing so, we can lift burden of work, improve quality, safety, and reliability for our processes. And uh, what we're going to do now is start with a little bit of a poll. And the poll asks... What's your experience uh, using lean methods in facility design? And if you could just go ahead and check um, your level of experience, that just helps us all understand where we all are coming from. It's great. It's looking like uh, many folks have uh, had some participation so far. All right. We are going to go ahead and uh, close the poll now. And um, the results of that poll you should see on your screen now looks like that uh, about half of the people, a little bit more than half of the people, have uh, uh, not really heard much about it. So I'm excited to continue the conversation with you. Also looks like we've had some participants and uh, some leaders in the work. So I'm looking forward to all of your questions as we go forward. And about 30% of us have actually participated in events. That's excellent. So I'm looking forward to uh, very insightful, intuitive, and challenging questions. So um, after waste, we look at flow. At Virginia Mason, we consider flow to be the DNA of any good process. It's the, uh, the symphony of flow is the coordination between our patients, their family, our care providers, and when we look at the flow of providers, we actually look at all of those who have a touch point of care with our patients. So that could be the uh, physician, physician assistants, nurses, techs, coordinators, administrative staff, transporters, housekeepers, everyone who comes in contact with the, the patient, and those people who are essential to processes running well. Medications, supplies, and equipment, having what we need, where we need, when we need it, clean, ready, uh, and appropriate, and functional for use. And then the flow of information. Information has many forms for us in facility design, what we see, what we hear, what we share, all very essential. And facilities can allow us to see, 
hear, respond to the information that's delivered easily or with great complexity. And so as we think about future, we want to make sure that we coordinate how and understand how we share information and make the best of our designs and our process flows. All of which fall under this new thinking about old ways of doing our work and changing that way of doing our work to a lean mindset that's really that process engineer designing for success, designing for flow, designing for the exceptional patient experience. How we understand flow is best represented in this picture here. It's really just taking the spaces uh, we have and showing the flow of the patient. In our book, Transforming Healthcare, which is the uh, Virginia Mason story of how we began uh, going from learning about the Toyota production system to declaring and using every day the Virginia Mason production system, you'll hear the story about a cancer patient that we followed um, with the, uh, the caption of the blue yarn. And this is the actual blue yarn from that story, the journey of a cancer patient throughout the medical center on the day of their treatment. We had no idea that this was the patient experience until we actually traced the flows. And so this was very enlightening to, for us to see uh, not our experience, but truly the patient's experience. And so when we take the time to map the flow, we begin to understand our opportunities. The greatest opportunity we saw in that design was that we really need to think differently about making patients go to services and bringing services to patients. All of this really has to fall into three main uh, dimensions that must stay in balance in order for us to not only have the facilities we need, but also uh, the performance levels and the quality standards we're looking for. So first and foremost, we want to make sure that what we build, what we design, what we create, and what we implement is safe for both our patients and our staff. Every opportunity we have to build and create and innovate allows us to enhance and improve our quality and get us closer to that vision of zero defects in healthcare. We know it's possible and we just have so much work to do to get there. We also want to look at the ability to um, flex and adapt to the changes in populations and care needs that exist in healthcare. Something seems to change every day. We, um, we do so much more in the outpatient setting than we used to do. Uh, and that world just continues to adapt, change, and evolve. And our facilities often are built in 50-year blocks. So how do we create facilities that can be as flexible as the process changes without being extremely disruptive to normal daily operations? And then finally, making sure that we have strong uh, economic performance out of the facilities we build because they are expensive and um, we want to make sure that what we build is what we need in order to continue to grow and develop our organizations, reinvest in our care and equipment in our people. So what are some of the benefits of lean design? Uh, lean design helps reduce the walking distance for patient and staff. Um, where there's walking distance that isn't about promoting your health, but it's just be able to get to the next step in the service, there are, caught, there are delays. Where are there where there is walking distance unnecessarily for staff, there's opportunity for interruptions, distractions, and that potentially could affect quality. Uh, improving visibility for our patients and our team members. We find that when patients have a visual connection more frequently with their care team, there's less confusion, less concern. On the inpatient, we tend to see that in a reduction in call lights because people have quicker access to their care team. Also, we know that um, by locating our care team members closer to where the patients are, we can help reduce some of those hospital-acquired uh, injuries like falls and uh, patients declining without uh, uh, immediate uh, eyesight from our staff. We know that we can reduce the burden of work for our team members. Whatever time and unnecessary work we can remove from our team members, we give them time to think. And critical thinking on patient care is the most essential skill and tool we have uh, for advancing healthcare and improving the quality for our patients. Um, improving throughput so we get better performance, being able to do more with the facilities we have. Uh, eliminating space uh, that is unnecessary, that adds no value. So what do we do about those traditional waiting rooms? Uh, what could we do with those waiting rooms if indeed patients aren't able to 
moves smoothly through our processes, could we repurpose some of those spaces for patient education, whether it be passive or deliberate, that allows us to continue that engagement and continue um, connecting with our patients in many different ways. A bit like Disney. You know, when you wait in a line at Disney, you have many things to focus on, but we tend to just have big, beautiful waiting rooms that uh, tend to have uh, old magazines, which let's not even talk about the infection control issues on those. And then also facilities that can um, grow and develop over time as our care models grow and expand and develop to meet the continued needs in the, in the most appropriate environments for our patients going forward. All of these benefits really uh, inspire people to think differently about facilities that typically in their career are once in a career opportunity to leave a legacy for the next generation of care team providers. Old ways of thinking, bigger's better. Um, it takes a long time to do this work. It's uh, um, large dedicated spaces that have single purposes. Uh, we find that that's probably the number one reason that patients have to travel to the service. Equipment that's big and bulky and dedicated for single function and purchase solutions versus discovered and invented solutions. So what we really want to do is we want to think differently. We want to be more nimble. We want to act quickly, do rapid cycles of change, learn by doing. Um, we want to create facilities that can flex. Um, so could we, as an example, develop an in intensive care facility that over time can flex without a whole lot of remodeling to a progressive care facility because our, our patient population has shifted slightly. Solutions for improving and repurposing what we have before we purchase. So have we really optimized the use of what's available to us within our system before we buy more? Uh, more is not always helpful. I wanted to give you um, an example of how we can use Lean to understand the staffing levels we need, the types of equipment, the types of spaces we would need. And we use a very basic um, number of operators needed calculation that we have in our Lean Toolkit. And it's the um, to find out how many units or rooms or resources we need, it's the sum of the cycle time of when that space, that equipment, that person is involved divided by the tack time of the services provided. Cycle time is something to is not something that we can pull off a, uh, a data analysis timesheet. It's really something that requires our eyes and our feet to be on the shop floor looking at the work so we understand why the cycle time is what it is. So it is an observed cycle time. And tack time is something that we calculate. It tends to be the process provocation because where we are and where we need to be helps us understand that gap for improvement. So tag time is that available time divided by the demand in the process. So let's set, take that into an actual example. So the, this is a classic thing that I get by working with organizations all over the world. We just need more exam rooms. If we had more, we could do more work. So the question is, how many exam rooms do we really need? So here's an example. By calculating the tack time for a clinic, 48 patients want to be seen in eight hours of that clinic function. This clinic doesn't take time off for lunch. They cross cover shifts so that a patient could call and come in at lunchtime if they had availability. So that clinic has 480 minutes of available time. So that's the um, eight hours times 60 minutes per hour. So 480 minutes divided by the 48 patients who wanted to be seen that day. So that would mean that that clinic would need to flow at a pace of 10 minutes. Um, so if I was the manager, what that would look like in an ideal sense would be that every 10 minutes I'd see a patient entering my clinic and every, a patient leaving the clinic. Most people confuse tack time as the total time for the process, and that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about aligning our process flows and our resources such that a patient moves through the process and exits the process every 10 minutes. It's not the 10 minute visit, so I just want to be clear about that. What we do next is observe the cycle time. And so we're going to look at the, the patient room as an operator. So from the time a patient enters that exam room until the time they leave the exam room with their services uh, completed. What we observed was that 40 minutes um, 
was the total time for the patient from entry to exit of the exam room. But in our observations, because we were there seeing it, we saw that there was actually 20 minutes where the patient was in the room by themselves. Most of us know that that is a case for strong patient dissatisfaction. Patients waiting in exam rooms on their own tend to be the greatest opportunity for many clinics to improve their overall patient satisfaction scores. But when we looked at this, we saw that not only was it 20 minutes of wait time, but it was caused because people had to leave the room to get what they need that should have actually been in the room, but it wasn't routinely in, and uh, regularly stocked. So, and then we also noticed, because we were in the hallway doing those observations, that each time the provider left the room, they were interrupted with questions. So what seemed to be only a one-minute quick exit back to the patient really turned out to be about five or six minutes because, oh, if, if I could just ask you one question before you get back in with that patient. So again, 20 minutes of face time with the patient that was spread over 40 minutes of um, wait time and work time. So if we do that calculation of um, uh, observed cycle time divided by the tack time for that process, we would need four exam rooms. So here's the opportunity from a lean perspective. What if we found a way to eliminate the 20 minutes of waiting in the exam room? How many, oops, how many exam rooms would we actually need? So let's take a look at that. So now our observation, it's not 40 minutes. We've been able to eliminate the reasons why people need to leave the room. Therefore, they were able to stay continuous with the patient for the, um, for the visit, so 20 minutes of, of time in the room, over that continued tack time, we would only need two exam rooms. So that kind of leads us to a reflection. What could we do to eliminate the waiting waste? Because this is a huge opportunity. We may not have the money to build four exam rooms per provider, but we might have the, um, the bandwidth, uh, financial bandwidth, to build two rooms or three rooms per provider. So what do we do? How could we eliminate this waste? Some of the things that we've found work very well in a lean focus process is to put things that are frequently used, those supplies that we use each patient every day, at, in small quantity at point of use. This is good basic 5S. Um, Study other causes, why providers have to leave the room before they're finished. Are people knocking on the door and interrupting? Do we have good setup? Do the provider have the information and um, known types of care events they will need to provide for that patient when they're in the room, or do they have to stop what they're doing and, uh, and retrieve that information or retrieve that support? And are we moving the patient to the service or are we bringing the services to the patient and the provider? So those are some real opportunities that can help bring down the wait, the wait time. And then let's say we do have the money then. So we can build four exam rooms, not two. What could we do with the space if we actually had lean process flow in place? Well, we can grow the business and we could add more providers to the mix. So this is our opportunity to take something that most people would say, if we just had more exam rooms, we could do more work. We realize if we just have more exam rooms without changing the process and bringing lean thinking into how we organize the space and how we organize our flow, we'll actually run out of space faster. But if we bring lean thinking in and we improve the quality of people doing the work, everyone doing the right work at the right time for the right reasons, supplies at point of use, reducing the need for um, the, the cause of interruptions, we actually can grow the business. This is a huge opportunity. So what we're really talking about is that um, the old equation of form follows function is still true, but if we really want lean facility design, we want lean form following lean function. So it's in the lean process, the attention we put to bringing lean into our daily process flows, especially the things that we do every day. Most people like to bring lean into the most complicated and less frequent work that we do because their fear is it's when it becomes more complicated, more exceptional, our day is disrupted. And what we found in our observations is by focusing on the 80, not the 20, the normal part of your day and standardizing that part of the day, you find that your days flow uh, much more efficiently. So design the facility for the most frequently served patients and then begin to think about how can we then further develop the facility to support those patients with exceptional needs that tend to go beyond our normal. This has been a real aha moment for many people 
work in our, our work we do on lean facility design. Just to put a plug out there that if questions do come up, please continue to type them into the chat or the question area and I'll be able to answer them in flow. So how do we then get people thinking differently and how do we bring lean into um, lean thinking into the opportunity most organizations have for new space design. We use a, a 3P process. I've uh, been able to, been very fortunate to conduct many 3Ps across the United States. In fact, I know a few folks listening in today have participated in some of those 3Ps. So just a quick shout out and hello to all of them. It's exciting to hear the successes that you're having. Um, 3P stands for Production Preparation Process Workshop. What, why do we do a 3P? We do a 3P when we have new opportunities, new thinking, when we're really thinking about ground, greenfield type work, not brownfield work. So new spaces are needed, new products and services are required. We have new providers and new process opportunities. So these are all great, um, great opportunities. And additionally, when we want to establish a whole new vision for our care, that then can map to new facilities and new processes and new services and the hiring of new providers, we can also use uh, 3P for new vision. So what we do first in a 3P, it's very difficult um, to get people who are used to making a facility work for them and processes that probably aren't as elegant as they need to be. They make them work every day and they do great work. People that are doing amazing work with huge burdens in their way to care for patients every day. So we have to be very deliberate and, and walk them through a process that allows them to leave where they are and begin to think about that ideal or that insanely great ideal state. What if you had no worry? What if cost wasn't an issue? What if boundaries didn't exist? How would you provide that care? And then once we have that vision clear, then we work our way backwards to now how do we make it happen step by step from the reality of where we are to now where we want to go. I would say probably one of the greatest opportunities people have with new facility design is to really think about building a facility to realize a vision instead of building a facility to take one step forward for quality. I think that allows us to bring greater flexibility and think about the, the one-year purpose of the new facility, the two-year all the way up to the five, ten-year purpose for this facility because we have that vision of what care could be once we achieve that insanely great ideal future state. We use, um, with many of our clients, rapid process improvement workshops or RPIWs to begin the work forward because again, you have this in compelling vision, you have these features, you're about ready to enter into a design process, but we still don't have a way of changing the process and make it more effective and engage more people in this overall change effort. So that's where the rapid process improvement workshops really come in. Both 3Ps and RPIWs are five-day events. They um, have very structured standard work for planning. It's a way of engaging people, provoking people to think differently, and once we have that new vision from the 3P, we can use those RPIWs to say, what are the barriers at where we are at this moment in time in our processes, in our space, that are preventing us from realizing that compelling vision that we've invented. And we, we begin to um, then start improving those processes. The key is getting that improvement started as we're developing the new facility. So the more we can do now, the more information we can feed into a traditional facility design project. We've actually taken it one step further for um, facility design and we've brought lean not only into the thinking forward about who we want to be and how do we want to work and where do we want to work and developing those new lean ideas, but we actually bring lean into the development of the facilities itself and it's that continual coaching and developing through the rapid process improvement workshops post 3P event that helps change the process but then also helping mentor the, the architects, the designers and the builders um, to develop with new ways of doing their work as well. And I've been fortunate to work not only on the owner, the, what's traditionally known as the owner side or those of us in healthcare who provide care to patient side, but also on the design side and the construction side. So this is a, a way of thinking that can enhance all of our work 
And as a result of that collaborative lean approach into our work, changing our work to increase value, eliminate waste, reduce cost, unnecessary cost, reduce uh, rework, we wound up with facilities that really work for us as soon as we enter them and as we continue to use them with minimal changes, um, minimal rework. Um, it's, very, it's very common for organizations to have a facility developed and then within the first six months really start thinking about um, what are the remodel changes that we need to do to truly uh, uh, make the processes flow well with the space we have. And oftentimes that happens because we haven't thought as deeply about our future state as we need to at a measurable, um, implementable way. And so by getting into the spaces, we start to realize we had some places where we guessed and now we need to refine that. Since we've been bringing lean thinking into the, the visioning, the developing, the improving, and then getting into the space, we've had none of that. Um, zero punch list items is a goal we have at Virginia Mason, and um, we measure the number of times we have to remodel the space to make it work within the last, within the first six months, and we've, uh, we continue to have very, very low um, expenses, uh, which is exciting to see. It's a, it's a marker that the process is working for us. So a traditional design process is very iterative. We discuss, we develop, we evaluate, we try it out, we, we give feedback, then we discuss again, we develop another concept, we try it out, we give feedback. What we find is that the 3P allows us to start the process much sooner with much more information about how we want to work, what spaces we want to work in, what are the features, what are the characteristics. And so the, the overall design and construction process becomes much more about executing on a very clear vision, a very tangible vision, um, and then that also improves that overall value once we move into the space. So we do the alignment, we set the expectations, we declare that vision, and we really describe the process at a very granular level with a, with a forward-thinking perspective, and then we go into the design process. This helps to reduce the overall project lead time and really what we're taking out of the process is all the rework waste because we think we heard, therefore we developed for you to evaluate, but then we've made a change to our process. Now we know more, which is going to change the design, and then we have to take it back and rework it again. So we've uh, really helped to eliminate a lot of that iterative um, cycling of learning. We, we pay the learning uh, forward so that we can more... Um, more effectively use the skills and abilities of our design and build partners as we go forward. So who makes up a great team? Uh, a great team is composed of uh, mostly people who do the work and patients who receive the care. So it's their insights that really allow us to think differently. We have our own way of thinking. We have our own frame of reference. We call that our mental valleys, the way we see things, the way we make decisions, the way we lead improvement. But something has to allow us to think differently, and it's that outside perspective. Um, I may know what is best practice in a facility development, but I need to hear from the frontline team members how they want to work, and that helps me understand things like, you know, for plugs, outlet plugs for um, IV pump recharging probably make more sense to have it at waist high or to shoulder height versus, um, you know, a foot or so from the floor because the bending and, and uh, flexing that staff have to do and the potential back injuries that we're eliminating when we do that. It also makes it easier for them to remember to charge the pumps when they put them back in the storage area because they can see the plug. That's just one example of feedback we received from staff that really helped enhance the environment. The other thing is never underestimate the small things, the small touches where a staff member can see that, wow, you heard me, you listened to me, you put that plug there. It's very respectful of our people. We also want to make sure that our operational leaders, any lean support, and our, our internal and external design um, project management firms all work together to the shared objectives. So this helps us round out the team, which allows us to do our best work and each member of the team to be an effective contributor to add value throughout the whole process. Um, 
The other thing that we have shifted from, we've had a learning journey over the last 15 years. We used to design our, our drawings and then we'd run our mock-ups and then we'd change all our drawings. So we decided to reverse the process. Before we commit to drawing, we actually do as much mock-up as we can. This is an example of a new um, surgical environment that we created here at Virginia Mason, which includes imaging support within the OR. This was new for Virginia Mason when we developed this room, so we had to run real simulations with the team to just determine where is the best location for the control room, where should the monitors be, where is the C-arm um, stored, and where is it coming to. So we ran real simulations, and so by the time we actually drew the room and designed the room, we knew exactly where things needed to be. This cut down the design time significantly. And the team had a lot of fun, and through all of those simulations, as this new facility was being developed, we were able to simulate and train and make people more ready for the new space to, again, reduce that time to full utilization of the new space. It's been a win-win for everyone. Here's another example of um, trying out where do, where do things belong on the head wall, and so preparing this and then allowing nurses to have cutout pieces where, where they feel things should belong, and then running um, mock simulations of the care that allowed us to place things in the right way and keep those cords from getting in the way of patient care and, and allowing things to be further away from the patient, although completely accessible for staff. So try storming really is our opportunity. Trying and storming through the trying helps us learn Brainstorming just gives us ideas that we might talk ourselves out of. So try storm, not brainstorm. Definitely an opportunity to bring greater value into the work. I want to take you through just a couple examples of how we've used this thinking before we get into um, your questions. So the um, Center for Hyperbaric Medicine was one of our first big projects. And one of our challenges with our old facility was that uh, we had one door into the hyperbaric chamber, and once you pressurize that space, it's very hard to um, and impossible immediately to bring another patient in if they were stuck in traffic or late for their care. So what we, we also had a very limited and cramped space. So what we did was we created a single chamber that has three sections, and the middle section is actually more of an entry and exit port so if a patient was delayed or we had to add on a patient, we could flex them into the flow by pressurizing that center and then let them move to either side. We were really trying to create more flexibility and also a much more effective and nurturing and healing environment for our patients. In addition, we were able to find space within the organization that improved the flow for inpatients um, to receive this service, and so we deferred a $6 million cost to new facility by using existing space within the medical center footprint. In our cancer center, we learned from our patients. We learned that not every patient needs the same thing, and that actually influenced um, the same level of care, influenced the types of spaces. So we actually have three uh, different environments for patients. One for patients receiving longer-term care, uh, uh, maybe a six to eight hour infusion, they have windows, they have space for their family, comfortable chairs. We have patients who are just coming in for a quick exam and follow up with their physician. And we also have patients who are just in for very brief periods um, for injections, quick consultation, and, and then they want to go. And so we created environments and placed those environments that are the least time consuming and um, the most frequently uh, the shortest distance, I should say, for the, the care. We put those near the front door so that patients wouldn't have to walk all the way into the department just to get a quick bit of care from their care team. So we have a short stay area, we have an exam and treatment area, and then we have a longer term treatment area. And then we also heard from our patients that they wanted to receive, they wanted to have a place where they could socialize if they were feeling up to it. So we do have a little cafe area where they can sit with family, friends, maybe they've made a connection with another patient and rather than sit in the room that day, they just want to have the opportunity to socialize a little bit, lift the spirits, and uh, um, make the six to eight hour infusion time pass a little better. In dermatology, we really challenged the concept of no waiting rooms. And so we said, what could we do with um, patient care space, if we optimize the patient um, care space to flow, and we wouldn't need as many um, 
areas uh, for patients who may need to wait a little bit to start their care, what could we do with the leftover space? So what we did is what you see in the lower right corner is we created a Medispa. So it's a retail space within the dermatology department that allows patients to have medical care, but also maybe a little restorative nurturing care from our spa, which um, is no longer a space that just sits empty full of chairs. It's actually a space where we generate revenue for the organization. Patients love it, and of course the organization uh, benefits from the revenue. Our uh, Kirkland Clinic was the first time we took a whole clinic approach to all of our flow concepts. Um, here you see around the outside the exam rooms. These exam rooms are two-sided. We have an on-stage flow for patients where they come in and experience the environment. And then we have the off-stage flow for the team. So when they're not working with patients, they have that quiet space to collaborate, to focus on work that isn't about patients in the exam rooms. And it allows both the um, care teams and the patient to meet where care occurs, which is in the exam rooms. We also um, thought about the flow of supplies. So how could we bring things into the room and ensure that what's needed on the shelf is stocked and ready when people need it? So we have these two-sided um, supply cabinets. So from the hallway, without disrupting patient care, we can replenish supplies. So if we see in this, uh, on the left side, you see these little, um, in the peekaboo window, these bins, these bins are empty and need to be replenished. Someone walking down could do that, put the bin back in place, as you see in the lower right where the bins sit. Um, it's a two-bin exchange Kanban, one bin of normal use, the second bin of backup um, use of, of supplies that are enough to allow us to, to go send the other bin out, get it filled and back onto the shelf. So in that replenishment cycle, we still need supplies, so that's what that second bin does. So they exchange with one another, ensuring that we have supplies at point of use at all times. We also saw that there are times when the, the trash and the linens need to be um, emptied, but care is still going on in the room, so we can do that also offstage behind the scenes. We continued this thinking with our new uh, Virginia Mason University Village Medical Center where we have adult services, pediatric services, and on-site and visiting specialties. So uh, each time we build, we carry concepts forward. So this um, carries forward the concept first uh, developed in uh, Kirkland, which is intuitive wayfinding for patients so that they can room themselves if they feel they want that service and if they're able to room themselves, this gives time, the time back to staff to prepare for their visit off stage. But you notice this is the forest hallway. So patients walk down to forest exam room two. They see the forest leaves on the room sign and they see the birch trees in the forest down the corridor. So that's how they know they're in the forest corridor. One of the nice things we added to this design was these little pop-out um, sections where you see the trees and that's a way of helping to buffer some of the noise so that patients really don't experience noise in the exam room. In the lower left corner you see the flow stations where provider and medical assistant work side by side immediately adjacent to the back door of the patient room and then um, the lower right is where the patient and provider come together so one of the things we did here was to soften the edge of the, um, the place where patients and providers uh, come together to share information so that it looks more like a space for having a conversation. Our largest project to date was the Jones Pavilion, um, over 300,000 gross square footage. Uh, we have operating rooms and integrated procedure center where interventional radiology uh, interventional cardiology and therapeutic interventional gastroenterology all share a procedure space where the procedure labs themselves are very specific to the service, but the admission and recovery area is a shared resource across all services. Um, this, uh, this is a significant change for Virginia Mason where traditionally we've had these labs and admin recovery areas spread throughout the organization. So this was a way of optimizing and centralizing our care, yet still specializing to the particular needs of each service. We also have an emergency department, critical and progressive care, and then um, inpatient uh, floors. The top floor of the building has the best views of Seattle, and so we gave that floor to our uh, inpatient oncology 
patients. One of the things that we were able to do with this design was to create interstitial floors between each of the patient care areas so that the um, people coming to work on the mechanical, improve the electrical, wiring, data ports, all of that happens behind the scenes in um, behind the scenes balconies in, in between each of the floors. This also allows us to move into this building over time but yet allow each floor to have its own air handling and mechanical support. Therefore, um, we don't have to heat and power and cool the whole building even though we're only occupying um, 50% of the floors upon opening. I think we're about 75 to 80% occupancy now, but those floors that aren't um, fully occupied by patients don't have to run as if they were fully operating. So this is a way of helping to be good stewards of our environment and our resources. The inspiration of taking lean into how we approach our facilities also carried over to our builder friends and they were able to do um, external setup for a lot of what gets put into place traditionally one by one, piece by piece, location by location. So this is just an example of taking advantage of subassembly of mechanical systems, very complex systems. When you think about it, they're having to do this with their hands over their head. So being able to build these effectively in sections and then bring them together as you set them in place helps not only to improve the quality of the installation, but also reduce the time to, to install for each of these areas. We had the same experience with our inpatient bathrooms in the critical care unit. We built them one by one on our first inpatient floor when it came time for critical care. Just like cruise ships, we had them assembled off-site and then they were brought in and set in place. This helped reduce the overall build time for that unit, a much more complex unit than a traditional med surge area. We reduced the total lead time from initiation of build to occupancy by 50%. So that, uh, that brings us to the end. So the value of bringing lean um, through using the Virginia Mason production system at every step of the process is that we engage more people. We have much better thinking, great ideas that come to life. We're able to think quite radically to insanely great levels and still be able to build to meet those um, ideas and expectations. Our footprints are much more meaningful. Oftentimes when people come to visit Virginia Mason, they see that these, um, these spaces are quite simple. They're very intuitive. They make a lot of sense. And I, I would often say it's because the people who do the work design the spaces. And that um, we, we ensure that not only is lean improvement brought into the, the time when we're uh, developing our new facilities, but what we find is that the rate of acceleration for embracing lean thinking and lean activities on these teams often accelerates because they have their new space. So this isn't about getting it right and ready and for the first build. These teams actually move in and the space becomes more of a laboratory for new thinking, creative thinking, patient-centric, value-added thinking each and every day. And we've seen that grow. It's a very exciting time uh, for healthcare facility design. So we're into our... Um, question and answer phase and uh, we have uh, we have a few questions so um, how do you determine if uh, windows are in on stage or off stage areas Sally um, asked that question well Sally I think we have to think about what's the purpose of the space and are windows appropriate um, for uh, is it a patient comfort um, does it ensure their privacy so we often make decisions about furnishings and features of each room against the criteria for that room. Uh, we use those little windows um, and you notice that they're frosted because on uh, we don't want uh, someone to have the inside cabinet open and have a clear window so that someone um, in the staff area could see through into the room and see the patient. We want to make our patients feel like they still have their privacy. Uh, so again, it's it's really thinking about the um, elements and criteria needed for a room and then building to meet that criteria. Um, and then we had another question earlier, how can we optimize the workflow without redoing 5S, spaghetti diagrams, et cetera? I think that, um, 
I think that uh, 5S and understanding our flow isn't a static process. I think we always have to go back and look at um, what is the current state, has it changed, and are there further opportunities? I think one of the things that people often say is, we got it right, now it needs to change again, and they feel bad. I think that's the purpose of lean improvement. By doing something, we learn where we need to go next. So I think that it's not about optimizing so we never change again, it's optimizing so that we intentionally change again each and every time. I had a question from Bob about how do you recruit patient members um, onto the design team? Uh, that was more of our rate limiting step than the patient's rate limiting step. Uh, we have found that by reaching out to patients, uh, we have a program at Virginia Mason uh, based on our uh, experience-based design work um, in engaging patients, we have a patient family partners program. And that patient family partners program allows us to um, survey the needs of, of our patient partners who, what is their interest? What are they interested in? We often um, talk with our providers to say, do you have patients who are interested? Uh, we, we have less of a problem with getting patients involved um, than getting the organization quite frankly, willing to uh, allow patients to be on teams where we're talking about things that aren't working. But we're trying to be much more transparent, and as we coach organizations and work with organizations, we really encourage them to think about the voice of the patient in their work. So there's many approaches, Bob, that allow us to do that. Direct invitation, um, finding ways to capture patient experience, asking patients. It's very common during a 3P that um, people work with me on that I'll ask them, you know, instead of assuming that you know what patients want, let's just take 30 minutes and go out and ask them and see what they think. Because we are in a medical center and there's patients everywhere, so we can ask them. Um, so we had a question about uh, from Edward about VM offering on-site lean design consultation service. Absolutely we do, and at the end of this we'll, uh, we'll put up a slide that uh, directs you to all the resources we have. The next uh, big opportunity, Edward, is that we have a lean facility design workshop here in Seattle, but uh, all of this 3P work and RPIW work that we do, we can bring on site to your organization. So we're happy to uh, talk with you about that. Um, so there's a question uh, from Gabriel about um, how much observation time is needed one week. I think, um, Gabriel, often it depends on the process and the space. Um, the shorter the process, the more focused the space, the less observation. But I think that what most people realize is um, the hardest part to doing the observations is just finding the time to get out there and do it. But once they get out there, it's hard to, to pull them back, and, and I don't want them to. I think it's just, um, you know, you know when you'll know, and through our coaching, we can help you understand. So we've done, we've gone out, we've looked, we've observed, we've heard this. We reflect on it. Now, what do we need to do next? So it's a, um, it's not a, a one-time thing, or a, we can't budget a certain amount of time. We won't really know until we go out and see. We are um, fond of uh, quoting Mr. Cho from um, Toyota. He was the Toyota leader who uh, was inspired um, through direct relationship with Taiichi Ono, the founder of the Toyota production system. And his three words are, go see, ask why, show respect. And we build most of our thinking and our training here, and especially with our new facility, lean facility development. Um, you know, we don't know until we go see. We won't understand until we ask why. And we must engage as a way of showing respect for our people. So a question from Bill about mock-ups in the surgical areas. Um, we'd love to have mock-ups in surgical areas, Bill, but um, I, I think what we tend to do is create a mock surgical environment um, offstage. We, we have the opportunity of growing into our Jones Pavilion over time, so we still have a few empty floors. And so we use those floors to, um, to create as real an environment as possible. What we find out, Bill, is it's if we make it at least close and 3D and real, um, it becomes a more rich experience for our staff than um, evaluating a 3D fly-through diagram or looking at two-dimensional drawings on paper. They tend to get the 3D space a lot faster. 
Our mock-ups start very simply with uh, tape on the floor. We grow to cardboard, and then eventually as we get closer and closer to final design, that's when you start to see things look like the picture of that uh, integrated OR that I showed you. So um, here's a question from Thomas. Uh, reflected in, uh, in your net to gross ratio, what is the VM benchmark for expected patient revenue per square foot or ratio to square foot per patient room? So that's a, that's a pretty um, complex question. I think the answer, Thomas, is it depends. One of the things we do um, when we launch the um, 3P planning work is to really talk about some of the business objectives and needs for the organization. Um, and I would say that what comes out of the um, calculations, um, we first have to talk about what are the desired and, and um, delightful uh, performance levels on margin, on quality, on service and delivery, and that would help drive those calculations. So we tend to focus on what's needed and then how would we measure it instead of how would we measure it and then make it work. Okay, so um, Gabriel had another question about what are the best metrics for uh, the observation study and then use to see the improvement. So Gabriel, we first start with time. So what is the total time for the patient experience from uh, initial um, interest or need for the service until the service has fully been provided? We tend to look at lead time, and in lean, lead time is the time for the, the, time for the process. So if we're looking at a clinic design, we may look at day of service lead time. If we're looking at optimizing the entire patient experience, including clinic design, we may look at from the lead time from the time they uh, have need of a service until that service has been provided. And then the sub-lead time would be the day of service from their arrival in the new space until um, they exit the space with their services uh, uh, delivered. So um, is there evidence-based literature at the present moment that suggests that 3P works in lean design? Um, I would say that um, the evidence is that our facilities are better, they um, are completed on time, they meet the budget, and um, the amount of rework to make them work and change them over uh, is reduced. I, I don't think that we're um, at a place where we can say the evidence from a purely empirical scientific standpoint can um, prove that this is a statistically significant way, but we, with the lean lens, we're not looking at that. We're looking at can we achieve the quality level, the performance metrics from the space, um, and we have been able to do that. Uh, there's um, uh, growing interest and work on true evidence-based design in this area, but I would say um, until there is a kind of a standard approach to 3P, we follow the, the roots of 3P, which is um, created from the, the architects of the Toyota production system, and, um, and I think there is wide variation in how people approach 3P, so I don't think we're at a level of being able to do a full evidence-based assessment on that. Okay, um, assuming physicians are engaged in your planning effort, especially in uh, the practices, how has lean design assisted them in meeting their RVU benchmark? Our physicians are paid based on meeting their RVUs. So Thomas, so are our patients, our, our providers here at Virginia Mason, as are many of the provider teams that I've worked with externally across the United States and in other countries even. Um, some countries do have uh, productivity-based performance um, compensation. And the, the engagement is if it's about them, they need to be there. One of the rules we have for 3Ps that we often really um, hold firm with organizations is that uh, the people who are affected by the space must be involved and must have representation. The other thing we do during our 3P events is we open the door for feedback a couple times during that time so that the team who's working on their ideas can uh, invite and engage other people who don't have the opportunity to go offline to do this work. Um, what we find, though, is by, 
by process improvements, and uh, many of these um, process improvements are dealt with in our uh, creating flow in the ambulatory setting workshop, we find that um, we do have better productivity for our physicians, and um, one of our other goals is home for dinner with their families so that they're not staying until 10 o'clock at night uh, logging in. We have um, a couple organizations that we worked with that have had great success in, better, in, in increasing their performance levels um, by better design and better process flow. So it's direct physician engagement and um, changing question, uh, you know, finding the metrics that allow us to achieve our goals. But again, we want to have those conversations up front, not do something and then see if it's delivering what we want. All right, so we, we have time for one more question. And um, the question is, how do, how do you determine who should be involved in RPIWs and other improvement work? I think it's the um, it's going back to that slide of who should be in a 3P. It's the people who do the work. One of the things that um, I explored when we started doing lean facility design work here at Virginia Mason back in, in 2002 um, was the, the reflection that we all had when we toured other people's facilities and the number of staff who said, you know, if they would have asked me, I would have done this. And we said, you know, that can't be something that people hear when they come and tour Virginia Mason. And so we said, you know, what's it going to take to not have that statement made? And we said it's, it's through the direct engagement of the people who do the work. And so that is, that is the most important element of getting the facility that works for us is engaging those folks. And so we want to make sure that we have those people on the team with their voice being heard. And we also include in our 3P work ways of engaging the people who can't be there. How can they submit their ideas? So not just the, those open feedback sessions at the end of Tuesday, Wednesday of our workshops, but also in the planning, you know, what flip charts can we put up? What, what can we coach the organizations to get out there um, and gather uh, larger uh, experiential and, and ideas, experiential feedback and ideas from their teams prior to the event because the more we know coming into the event, the more we can do and the more we can accelerate and, and excite the teams with what, what we come up with um, by the end of the week. So I think we're at, our, um, at the end and I just want to thank everyone for their time and that um, we will be getting back to you with, our, um, with your questions and Jamie just has a few things to wrap up. So thank you all very much for your time. Thanks everyone for attending. If you're continu uh, interested in continuing your learning with us, as many of you have um, expressed you are, we have a couple upcoming training sessions. One is Creating Flow in the Ambulatory Setting, which is happening both in Seattle and Philadelphia. First time we're bringing our, one of our training courses to the East Coast, so very exciting time for us. As well as Lean Facility Design, which is in um, one of our first courses starting in 2017. If you can't make any of these dates, we can customize those experiences for you as we, as we earlier alluded to. And as stated earlier, the webinar will be recorded or was recorded and will be posted on our website at www.virginiamasoninstitute.org under our knowledge base. Additionally, the webinar attendees will receive a copy of the recording link and the question and answers that were answered today by Chris via email um, following this session. So check out upcoming events on our website at www.virginiamasoninstitute.org slash calendar and connect with us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter to stay up to date on Lean Concepts. Thank you all for attending, and we hope you have a wonderful day.